What does God say about circumcision? Now, I've given this sermon, or this kind of sermon, to the German audience because of the situation which is going on over there, but I thought I'll give it here as well because it should affect all of us. And many times, even when it comes to the issue of circumcision, there is confusion in the church as to what God says about it. First, I want to give you a, sh a short, brief background on what is happening in Germany and why this is potentially very telling and revealing in light of biblical prophecy. The New York Times wrote on June 26, a German court in Cologne, actually it's Köln, translated here as Cologne, ruled on Tuesday that circumcision or circumcising young boys represents grievous bodily harm, a decision that could have significant repercussions for religious groups. The president of the Central Council of Jews in Germany condemned the decision as an unprecedented and dramatic intrusion on the self-determination of religious communities and called on the German parliament to pass legislation protecting circumcision as a religious practice. There is a criminal law expert, it says in this article, Holm Putzke, not that you will ever have to remember the name, nor should you, but he wrote that hopefully a discussion will begin about how much religiously motivated violence against children a society is ready to tolerate. The local wrote on July 6, Germany is coming under increasing pressure over the court decision that ruled circumcision was bodily harm and thus a crime with the Wiesenthal Center quoting Hitler. For 3,500 years, every male child has entered the Jewish people through the rite of circumcision. We are not talking about a mere custom, but a biblical principle that has defined the Jewish people from time immemorial. They noted that Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler said in one of his infamous anti-Semitic rants that conscience is a Jewish invention, it is a blemish like circumcision. The Spiegel wrote on July 9, Israeli politician and committee member Danny Denon noted that Germany last banned circumcision in the country's darkest hour, referring to the Nazi years and the persecution of the Jews. The Associated Press reported that Denon said Israel would not tolerate, tolerate restrictions on the practice of Judaism anywhere in the world, and certainly not in Germany. The Central Council of Jews in Germany warned the ruling would make Jewish life in Germany practically impossible. Deutsche Welle wrote on July 11, It's highly problematic ruling for Jewish communities in Germany, Pinchas Goldschmidt, the president of the Conference of European Rabbis, told Deutsche Welle. Now listen to this carefully. Goldschmidt said he is just as shocked by opinion polls that show a majority of Germans welcome to Cologne's court ruling. The polls are a little bit divided as to how high the majority is. The most shocking, I believe, poll was that the members of the Christian Democratic Party, the CDU, has the highest number of those opposing circumcision, 68%. Agree with the court's decision saying it should be a crime. The Christian party CDU did that. Goldschmidt pointed out a rising tendency toward intolerance of religious minorities in Europe. As example, he cited a recent Swiss ban on building new minarets on mosques, a French ban on women wearing Islamic veils in public, and a debate in the Netherlands about kosher meat prepared by Jewish butchers. The BBC's Stephen Evans, that's written by the BBC, in Berlin says the German government is clearly uneasy about the ruling, particularly after accusations that it was inappropriate for the country of the Holocaust to outlaw a fundamental ritual of Judaism. The Spiegel also wrote on, Ju on July 12, calling it the worst attack on Jewish life since the Holocaust. The Conference of European Rabbis on Thursday strongly condemned a recent German court decision that criminalizes the circumcision of boys. He also said, or the spokesman said, that the ban on Shechita, 
which is the ritual slaughter of mammals and birds according to Jewish dietary laws, by the National Socialists, had also been a sign for many Jews that we need to leave Germany. But he added that a ban on circumcision, given the importance of the tradition, would send a much stronger message. There's a lot more I could quote. It's interesting that even though the majority of the German people upheld that decision by the court, the press has now, almost like universally, started to condemn that decision. The Saarbrücker Zeitung wrote, there is no exaggeration in the objection that this legal decision makes Jewish as well as Muslim life in Germany impossible. Die Welt wrote, a conservative paper, the circumcision of Jewish boys on the eighth day after their birth is the foundation of the Jewish religion. If it is suspended through disregard for freedom and of religions and Jewish life in Germany will no longer be possible. For the first time since the end of the Third Reich, Jews would be forced to leave the country in order to be able to adhere to this mandate of the scriptures. If that happens, it would send out a message with disastrous political consequences. But then listen to this statement, because I like to address this in the much broader context of what is happening in Europe. A ban on circumcision, be it Muslim or Jewish, is a manifestation of the increasing intolerance shown towards religious groups in the world. Intolerance can swell like a flood. If you don't dam it up, it will continue. The Frankfurter Rundschau left winged wrote, the rabbis' worries are justified. As long as German jurisprudence is concerned with finding a balance between the legally protected right of religious freedom and the right of physical integrity of the child, religious Jews and Muslims will see themselves as confronted by a climate of deformation. And that's exactly what happens, what is happening, what will happen. A relative of mine sent me a statement which was given to the German Parliament this week. It was a request to pass a law to make circumcision of young boys legal. I have it here right in front of me. I also have, by the way, the decision of the judgment uh, of, the, of the Court of Cologne in front of me, having read the entire decision, knowing full well what it says. So they made this appeal to the German parliament, but the problem is, even though it was adopted, the German parliament adopted it, the main parties did, not all the parties did, and not everybody in the main parties did either, but overall it was adopted uh, with great majority. So the decision was made to create a law making circumcision legal, the problem is that decision has no binding effect. So it's kind of a proposal, it's kind of a, a recommendation. And so now come already the legal experts and say, yeah, but. For instance, the Minister for Health stated that he's not sure that this can even be done through a legal act. Legal experts note that drafting legislation could prove tricky in balancing religious freedom on the one hand against physical integrity on the other. And so there are more and more voices saying, well, we can't really do it. I'd like to also point out that, let's see, I have another article which I found actually last night, which talks about this proposal in Parliament and listen to what it says. Not all were pleased by the decision, including the Federation of German Criminal Police. Well, you can't get much higher than that. Our constitution cannot be limited by a simple law, as Parliament is currently trying to do in panic, the chief of the police told the Osnabrücker Zeitung. The freedom of parents to practice religion will nevertheless be limited by a child's more important right to physical integrity. And guess what? Yes, you guessed it. A group of child protective organizations has also issued a petition calling for a two-year delay on any new law on circumcision so that the issue could be debated more intensely by experts. 
The group includes the police organization as well as Deutsche Kinderhilfe, which is German Children's Aid, and German Association of Physicians in Child and Adolescent Medicine. In the petition, they warn that a working group should be created before taking any legal steps that could permit the serious and irreparable intrusion on the physical integrity of a child. So, the Jews are not willing to wait for two years. And even then, they say, even if they should adopt a law like that, in all likelihood, it still will have to be tested by the highest court because without any question, lawsuits will be filed against it. So that will take another months, if not years. Now there are other religious persecutions going on in Europe, and I spoke about that in one of the recent Standing Watch programs. But today I'd like to address the issue, what does the Bible actually say about circumcision? Now it doesn't help if we start with arguments which might come out of our sophisticated scientific and medical mind, but which is not in accordance with scripture. See, that's counterproductive, because when we are asked then from the Bible to justify our claim, we cannot. What I'm talking about is the idea that sometimes you hear the notion, in Europe I heard it, in America you hear it quite a bit, that circumcision is a physical health law. In other words, that it's necessary to preserve the health of a child. Now there are physical health laws in scripture. You have the physical health law of clean and unclean meat. That physical health law didn't come into existence under Moses, as some have said. It was already in existence long before that. It was clearly in existence at the time of Noah because Noah was asked to take a, seven, a certain amount of clean and a certain amount of unclean animals into the ark. So in other words, there was already a distinction. And it didn't stop after Christ died. It is still in force and effect today. Peter, many years after his conversion, refused to eat any unclean food. That's a health law. It was clearly given for the benefit of the physical well-being of the people, because if you eat some of those unclean animals, whether it's lobster or crabs, I mean these are big sea spiders, you know, that can't be good for you. And of course, pork is another example, which proves, and that has been proven by the medical world, that it's not healthy. But when it comes to circumcision, if you say it's a health law, then it would be a timeless health law. It would have been in force and effect at the time when man was created, and it would have to be in time and effect today. And of course, that can't be true. We read nothing about circumcision prior to Abraham when it comes to righteous people. Abraham was the first one who was circumcised. Nobody prior to Abraham apparently was circumcised when it comes to the people of the Bible. And as we will see, the Bible also makes very clear that circumcision is no longer required for us today. So since it's no longer required for us today, it can't be a health law, otherwise it would be required for us today. But having said that, I still totally condemn the decision of the court in Germany because they totally misinterpreted and misunderstood what circumcision is all about. And we will talk about that in a moment. You see, circumcision was a sign of a covenant which God made with Abraham. Now you can read that in Genesis chapter 17. See, Abraham wasn't circumcised before he received these words from God. Genesis 17 and verse 11. Well, let's read, start with verse 10 to get the context. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. But you see, it wasn't only a sign of the covenant because when you go to Romans well, let's first go to Romans chapter 
4 and see again that it talks about the sign of the covenant. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. So you see, God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants, and as a sign that this covenant was made, circumcision was introduced. And it says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 11, and he received the circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision but also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So his point is he was already declared righteous before he was circumcised. That's where the Jews went off track terribly because they thought you couldn't be righteous unless you were circumcised. Paul makes clear that's not the case at all. Now it was also a covenant itself it wasn't only a sign of the covenant, it was also a covenant itself. Notice Acts chapter 7 and verse 8. Acts chapter 7 and verse 8. This is of course Steve's tremendously bold speech, his defense when he was accused and of course then they killed him after that. He says, then he gave him, God gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him, notice, on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So circumcision in Old Testament times was the sign of the covenant. It was also a covenant itself. Now it's clear that it couldn't be as a health law because otherwise God would have chosen not to reveal it to the righteous people prior to Abraham and when it was done away in the New Testament he would have gone against his own health law which is impossible to even contemplate. But at the same time, at the same time you have to say that God would not have asked Abraham and ancient Israel to become circumcised if this procedure had been harmful to them and if it had produced medical side effects as so many say today. So they're both wrong. Both extremes are wrong. Let's stick to what the Bible says. Abraham was circumcised when he was 99 years old. He circumcised his son Ishmael when he was 13 years old. And so many Muslims today circumcise their children later in life and they are 13 or less than 13 but they don't necessarily do it on the eighth day. But he circumcised his newborn son on the eighth day. As we have just read that was the command. And of course all the men of Abraham's household were also circumcised at the same time. And of course they were of course a lot, long, lot older than eight, year, eight days old. Now, as I will show you now, even though the Bible makes very clear the command is and was at the time the baby needs to be circumcised with the age of eight, there have been quite a few exceptions. Exceptions when people had neglected to do it. One interesting exception is in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. I want to take a few minutes to discuss that real quick because that has also caused a lot of confusion as to what that scripture means. Exodus chapter 4 beginning at verse 21. Here the Lord said to Moses, Exodus 4 and verse 21, when you go back to Egypt so that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in your hands, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let you go, let the people go. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass, verse 24, on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. 
Then Zipporah, Moses' wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Now, a lot has been written about this particular passage, and people have come up with all kinds of interesting ideas as to what that passage may mean. We have actually a Q&A on this one, titled, Why did God want to slay Moses after he had commanded him to free Israel from Egypt? Because after all, he had just told Moses, I'm, go I'm going to send you to Egypt and you're going to talk to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh will not let the people go unless he is forced to do so with a strong hand. And the next thing you read, here is God trying to kill Moses. Well, the Q&A points out that God did not try to kill Moses. But he tried to kill Moses' son, who wasn't circumcised. And the context of this passage, and also other contexts and other passages, show that the Bible sometimes reads, writes it in such a way you have to be careful that you don't misapply. For instance, when the curse was pronounced, uh, when somebody abused Noah, most people say, oh yeah, well, it was Ham who actually abused Noah, but the interesting thing is that Ham's son was cursed. Now it wasn't Ham, it was Ham's son who did it. And that's why he was cursed. So you have to look at that particular scripture to see the context. The same as some scriptures may be read to say that it was actually Moses who wrote down the Ten Commandments. But it wasn't Moses, it was God who wrote them down. When the word he is used in this particular case, it doesn't refer to Moses at all. Because God had just talked about Moses uh, Israel's firstborn son. So the Q&A points this out very clearly that it was actually uh, the firstborn son God wanted to kill and not Moses at all. That would be totally inconsistent. We write in our Q&A it would make little sense to assume that God had changed his mind a few hours later to kill Moses. The context of the passage shows that God did not intend to kill Moses, whom he was sending to Egypt to free the Israelites, but one of Moses' two sons who had not been circumcised. At the time of Moses, there was in fact a temporary law that God had given to Abraham to circumcise every male child. God specifically stated that, quote, the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. So it was referring to Moses' son. Now, why did, why did Zipporah act the way she did? Well, because it is clear that Moses didn't do what he was supposed to have done. He didn't circumcise his son. He didn't circumcise his son, apparently, because of Zipporah. Zipporah knew that. I found an interesting comment this morning in a commentary by Domelo saying this. It would appear from this mysterious incident that Moses had neglected to circumcise his son on account perhaps of the mother's objection to the right. Circumcision was not peculiar to the Israelites, but they alone circumcised infants. And that is an interesting argument today in Germany. They say, oh, why can't we wait until the child is an adult and then he can decide whether or not he should be circumcised. No, God had commanded to do it on the eighth day. The commentary goes on to say, what Zipporah objected to, therefore, may not have been the right itself, but its performance at such an early age. But now seeing the danger her husband was in, and recognizing that his sickness was the chastisement of disobedience, they kind of conclude that, that Moses became sick when, um, when, he, when God came to him, she overcame her reluctance and performed the ceremony herself. This incident is designed to show the importance of circumcision as the sign of the covenant between God and his people and the sin and danger of neglecting it. Now looking at the Sancino commentary this morning, they give both options. They say, on the one hand, it was God trying to kill Moses. On the other hand, they say, it could have been God trying to kill the uncircumcised child, which second alternative I prefer because otherwise the whole passage wouldn't make any sense to me. But you see, here was an exception. So the child was already older than eight days, but he was then circumcised when it came to the parents' attention that they had really had done it and, you know, that God was not looking too kindly at it. Another interesting scripture can be found in Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 2, where all the second generation of the Israelites were circumcised before they were allowed to go into the promised land. 
Now, there are many scriptures which show, and I don't want to take the time right now to look at them all, that it has to be done on the eighth day. Luke 1 and verse 59 talks about the fact that John the Baptist was circumcised on the eighth day. This is Luke 1 and verse 59. Luke 2 and verse 21 shows that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Later on, Christ says in John chapter 7, verses 22 and verse 23, to the Pharisees who accused him of healing someone on the Sabbath, he said, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath if that fell on the eighth day, so that the law of Moses shouldn't be broken. And he says, and you are accusing me of doing something wrong even though I healed the whole man. Paul is saying that he was circumcised on the eighth day in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. So the point was not that circumcision per se was wrong. The point wasn't that circumcision per se had to be done for physical reasons. It was strictly a religious right. And now Paul is making very clearly a point in Galatians chapter 5. He had already made the point in Romans that being circumcised or not circumcised had absolutely nothing to do with spiritual righteousness. It has nothing to do whether or not we are going to enter the kingdom of God. The problem was the Jews thought you had to be circumcised in order to be, en be able to enter the kingdom of God. And Paul says time and again, that teaching is wrong. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Galatians 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, he's talking to Gentiles now who were not circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now, why can he say that? Because he's talking now in religious terms. He's talking now about spiritual qualifications. He's saying, if you think you need to be circumcised so that you can inherit the kingdom of God, and if you are not circumcised, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he says, Christ will profit you nothing. He says in verse 3, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law, including the ritual law, which God and Christ did away with when Christ died and was resurrected. He goes on to say, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. See, that was the point. They were trying to be attempted, attempting to be justified by law. Oh, we are circumcised. Now we are the children of Abraham. Now we are going to enter the kingdom of God. Paul says, no. That's not what this is all about. You are fallen from grace, he says in verse 4. See, for we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And so we read in Acts chapter 15 about this great controversy when those of the circumcision of the sect of the Pharisees came and said, oh, the, you have to have the Gentiles circumcised before they could enter the body of Christ, before they could become part of the church. And there was this big controversy. And Peter pointed out that God gave the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles even though they were not circumcised. And so you read about the whole debate in Acts chapter 15 and ultimately they all agreed under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit that circumcision was not required any longer for Gentiles to become a part of the church. It was not required. It was not required. However, notice what we read in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. See, they had no access to the commonwealth of Israel. 
unless they became physically circumcised. They couldn't take the Passover unless were, even those who were living in Israel, they had to become circumcised first before they were able to partake of the Passover. And so Paul is saying here that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, both who? The circumcised and the uncircumcised, and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, talking here about spirit, uh, ritual laws, but also the debt or the, the, how can I put this, in other words, the document of indebtedness showing that through our sins we have brought upon us a death penalty. So Christ has done away with that, so as to create in himself one man from the two, thus making peace. Again pointing out that there is no longer a separation between Gentiles and Jews in the body of Christ, regardless of whether they are physically circumcised or not. But, like the sacrificial system was a forerunner for what Jesus Christ did. See, we are no longer under the tutor. See, we were under the tutor, we had to give sacrifices and offerings until Christ came. When Christ came and he died for us, the offerings and the sacrifices were no longer necessary. And in Hebrews you read about that and Paul had to tell the Hebrews that the time would come when the temple would be destroyed and sacrifices wouldn't even be possible anymore, but they weren't necessary. But they were a forerunner, they had spiritual meaning, symbolism. And so circumcision had spiritual meaning. Today you have to be circumcised no matter who you are in order to be in the body of Christ. Male or female. But we are not talking about physical circumcision now. We are talking about spiritual circumcision. Physical circumcision being a forerunner, a symbolic sign. Now, of course, there was never any circumcision in the Bible for the righteous people of circumcision of girls. You see, obviously, but the point still is the physical circumcision was a forerunner. Today you have to be spiritually circumcised. The Bible is very clear. Your heart, about which I talked in the sermonette, got to be circumcised. Otherwise you are not a member of the body of Christ. I can guarantee that. Notice in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 11. In Christ, Paul says, the same Paul who said, physical circumcision is no longer necessary. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we have to be, if you please, spiritually circumcised. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. But we, Paul is saying, are the circumcision. Now who is we? And who are the ones who are the circumcision? He says it right here, who worship God in the spirit. As Christ had said, God is spirit and you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. You can only do that if your heart is circumcised. That's already taught in the Old Testament. God already showed in the Old Testament that the physical circumcision was a forerunner for the spiritual circumcision which really counts in God's eyes. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in verse 16. You know, David said the same thing in the Psalms. He said, you really don't want sacrificial offerings. You know, what you want is a contrite heart. He understood that. 
the same here with circumcision. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16. Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So if you, are, if you are not circumcised spiritually, you are stiff-necked. In other words, you are trying to do it your own way. You are trying to figure out on your own. Apart from what God says, how you should live, what you should do. You see, but when God says in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, as we have just read, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, he realizes, of course, that you cannot do that. When he tells me, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, he knows I cannot do it. On my own, that is. God has to do it for us, but we have to allow him to do it. And so that's what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30. God is the one who has to give us a new heart, but we have to accept it. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. Here we read, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. And what will that do? Now, we have already read, you know, earlier in the sermonette, when we become those in whom the law of God is, and we are going to keep it. So he says in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. We are going to see lots of terrible things which are going to happen before Christ comes back. Many who refuse to circumcise their hearts will die. It says very clearly, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants and the heart of your children to an extent so that you shall live. We had better take God up on that offer. We had better accept what God offers us in God's church in that regard. Not just for ourselves, also for our children. And that means training up a child in the way he or she should go. And that means don't allow the child to do things he or she shouldn't do. In Jeremiah chapter 4, and in verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest. So the point is, unless you do that, unless you circumcise your heart, unless you allow God to give you a heart of flesh, my fury will come forth like fire. Now these are strong words. We're talking about the wrath of God. We're talking about the day of the Lord. We're talking about the time when God will pour out his plagues over this rebellious mankind and only very few will be left. And all of it is said and done. And nobody would be left unless Christ wouldn't intervene and stop the madness caused by Satan the devil and his demons and by those who are deceiving the whole world. And again, let's look at chapter 9 and verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 25 and 26. Behold, the days are coming, Jeremiah 9, verses 25 and 26. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will punish all those who are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Makes no difference. God will punish them all if they don't live a life pleasing to God. And then he lists them. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised physically. And all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart, spiritually. Now, of course, those nations are also uncircumcised spiritually, but that wasn't the point. The point God was making is he was looking for those who are circumcised in the heart and can find them. And that's why he's punishing them as a consequence. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Now, if you read something like that, think in terms of circumcision being a health law. It makes no sense whatsoever if you read a passage like this. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18. Was anyone called while circumcised 
let him not become uncircumcised. Oh, you know, obviously he cannot speak here in physical terms because if you are circumcised, you are circumcised. No, let him not become somebody who is spiritually uncircumcised is what he's saying. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Now he's speaking physically, let him not be circumcised for the purpose of becoming righteous, thinking that once you are called already being uncircumcised, you have to become circumcised in order to become righteous, in order to enter the kingdom of God. And so he says, verse 19, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Makes no difference. But here, keeping the commandments of God is what matters, meaning whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised has nothing to do with keeping the commandments of God. If you let the Bible tell you what's being said here. And so again, it is important that we understand what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. You have to be a Jew today. You have to be an Israelite today if you are a Christian. But not physically, spiritually. And so we read in Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, not in the eyes of God. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, that's not what God is looking for. But verse 29, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the latter. You got to be circumcised in the heart. You got to be circumcised in the spirit. And then read what it says, whose praise is not from men but from God. So again and again and again we are reading that physical circumcision is not the issue anymore for Christians today. And so we shouldn't make it one. In Galatians chapter 6 Verse 15, we read that before, let's read it again in the context and then I'll read a few more scriptures in the book of Galatians, well, one more. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, it says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. We are to become a new spiritual creation, a new man. That is what has meaning in God's eyes. Verse 13 in the same chapter, Galatians 6 and verse 13, For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Now wait a minute. If circumcision would be part of the law, again this passage would make no sense. There's obviously a distinction here. Paul is saying those who are circumcised, they don't even keep the law themselves. But they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. See, the whole idea was, oh yeah, you're going to be circumcised because now you show and prove your righteousness. Wrong, Paul is saying. Has nothing to do with it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Again showing that is not important whether you are of a Gentile nation originally, or whether you are of a Jewish nation, some feel they are better people because they have Jewish ancestry or Israelite ancestry. Nonsense! Nonsense! God is saying that means absolutely nothing. What means, what is important is that you are living God's way of li life no matter where you live and no matter what ancestry you are from. What it also means, however, is and I have a few more minutes to go here to explain this more fully, that circumcision is a neutral act. The church keeps away from saying one way or another. It has to be the decision of the parent. But I'm cautioning everybody. It better not the decision of the parent thinking, oh, this way 
my child is becoming more righteous, or I'm becoming more righteous because now my child is going to be circumcised, and therefore I have it assured that I can enter the kingdom of God, and so is my child. That would be exactly what Paul says, don't even think that way. But it's a decision of the parent as to whether they are going to circumcise their child or not. Now, if they circumcise their child, it should be, as the Bible says, on the eighth day. Now, the interesting thing is that Paul, after he spoke so vehemently against circumcision, in the context of religious righteousness, went ahead and circumcised Timothy, who was the son of a Greek father, but a Jewish mother, and as such wasn't circumcised. Now we have an update on this one, or a Q&A written by Eric Rank, but I'd like to briefly go through some of what is being said here, and let's turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. Then he came, that's Paul, to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So he did it because of the Jews. Showing, however, that it couldn't be against God's law to circumcise a child, or in this case even an adult. Not that it was necessary for righteousness sake. But it couldn't have been against God's will either in this particular case, otherwise Paul wouldn't have done it. So that's why the German court err so dramatically. They usurped the power and authority from the parents and from God and the Bible, something they should never allow themselves to do. But the point is, Paul did it because of the Jews. See, the Jews were extremely upset when later on they thought Paul had brought Greeks into the temple. Now, in fact, Paul hadn't, but they thought he had, and so they were tremendously upset about that. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 had told us that in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. He read that already. And Paul did it, but he did it because of faith working through love. Now let's understand that. Let's understand that. He did it because of the Jews who were in that region. Now let me read to you a few commentaries how they understand it correctly. The Nelson Study Bible says, Salvation wasn't the issue here. That wasn't the reason why Paul did what he did. Instead, Timothy became circumcised so that God could use him to reach all people, even the Jews, with the message of the gospel. See, he was more productive in the service of Paul as being a circumcised man than being an uncircumcised man because Paul wanted him to go to the Jews. The New Bible Commentary said, Paul circumcised him so that he might be the more useful in the work of the gospel. So while it wasn't necessary for salvation, it wasn't wrong to perform it. Timothy was a Jew. Paul wanted Timothy to help preach the gospel to them. It was an advantage for Timothy to be circumcised. Now this goes far beyond this particular incident regarding circumcision. That really addresses our way of life. And notice how Paul explains how he operated. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. And let's ask ourselves, is that the way we operate? Or are we of those who are uncircumcised in heart and thinking we always have to do it our way, the way we think it's right? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, 
I became as a Jew. And that is exactly why Timothy was circumcised by Paul. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, meaning under its penalty, as one under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. But you see, he wasn't really under the law any longer. He wasn't un any longer under its penalty because Christ had forgiven him and he had accepted that forgiveness. But he still was putting himself in a position of somebody who was under the law in that he hadn't received yet forgiveness of Christ to help him to come to that point. And he goes on to say, to those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. But he now put himself in a position how it is when somebody doesn't even know anything about the law. How can I help such a person to come to Christ, to come to God's way of life? And he goes on to say that I might win those who are without law. Win them so that they would then be with the law, you see. So it was a matter of approach. And since it wasn't wrong to circumcise Timothy under the circumstances, he went ahead and did it. Even though he made it very clear it was not necessary at all to do it from a spiritual standpoint. It would be wrong to do it from a spiritual standpoint if people thought it had to be done in order to obtain and inherit righteousness. And so he also warns in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, well let's just read it here. Beware lest somehow your liberty of yours, and you could talk about all kinds of liberties, become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Now you got to be careful too in the way you behave, even though you may know the law, you may know all the things you may be able to do or not do, make sure you don't become a stumbling block for others. God is telling us, stay away from every kind of evil. And other translations even have, avoid any appearance of evil. Because you may become a stumbling block for others. Or you see you in such a situation of, and you can do it, they can do it. But they cannot do it because they don't have the same kind of conviction, the same kind of understanding you might have. So Paul was saying, I want to make sure that we are not becoming stumbling block to pe blocks to people because of what we know. Now, There was another case, however, when Paul refused to circumcise the person. And the reason he refused to do it, because the issue now was salvation. And that was Titus. Okay, go back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And verse 3, so it took discretion. Paul needed to have godly wisdom to decide and to see in what case he had to do what kind of an action. In Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek. Now he didn't have a Jewish mother, he was a total Greek. Not even Titus was compelled by Paul to be circumcised. But this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And then he goes on with the discussion on how they were trying to do that. See, here in this particular case, Paul was saying, no, I'm not going to do it, because it would give the wrong signal. And so he refused. Showing again that circumcision, physical circumcision, is a neutral act. Has nothing to do with health laws. Has nothing to do with being more or less righteous than others. But let me also say that Paul didn't prohibit circumcision. That's important. Because here in Germany they are trying to prohibit it. And since Germany, unfortunately, is becoming so many times the leader of other countries, especially in Europe, the tendencies are there. The signals of fear and of warnings are there. Notice in Acts chapter 21 what Paul was accused of. See, the Jews, of course, being fully convinced that you had to be circumcised, 
accused Paul of prohibiting circumcision. And so in Acts chapter 21 and verse 21, here the elders come to Paul, and it says in verse 18, on the following day Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. So that was in Jerusalem. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Verse 20, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. Now these were believing Jews. And they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. And then they tell him, okay, in order to make sure that they understand that that isn't true, you know, do this and uh, do a certain vow, and Paul did that. But the interesting thing is, the accusation was that he was teaching the Jews who were living amongst the Gentiles that they ought not circumcise their children. The Living Bible gives it much stronger, saying that you forbid circumcision of their children. Now that's not what Paul had done. He wasn't for prohibiting them to do it, only if it was done for the absolutely wrong motive. But the physical act as such was neutral. Paul speaks highly of circumcision in certain cases. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 11. He's talking about his co-workers here in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he mentions among others Mark in verse 10, the cousin of Barnabas. You know, there was a controversy between Barnabas and Paul at one time about Mark, but later Mark became very useful to Paul and worked for him. Verse 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Now, he is making this point, obviously, not in order to put down circumcision. Now, here he actually told them, well, look, these are people who are circumcised, and they are helping me greatly. Now, these were converted Christians. But then he also warns against those of the circumcision at the same time in Titus chapter 1. Now, these were the ones who were not converted and who thought that circumcision was necessary and maybe try to create a following after themselves. And so in Titus chapter 1 and in verse 10, look what he is saying to Titus, the one who wasn't compelled to be circumcised, remember? He says to him, for there are many insubordinates, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. So again, as I said, it was a neutral issue. It should be a neutral issue for us today. The church should not at all make any recommendations about it, one way or the other. If somebody comes to me and asks me, should I circumcise my son, my answer is, it's your decision. It's got to be your decision and your decision alone. But no state, no country, no earthly power should be given the right to prohibit it. And those who do that, they are challenging God. And I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of those who are challenging God. Because if they do, they will have to pay the price when their time of visitation comes.